Okay, there are different sources of uncertainty that are modeled in different ways. There is uncertainty that, that comes from the environment. The environment may be dynamic. There may be things happening in the environment, uh, not necessarily because of the actions of the agent, but because other things are happening, inclu including some random processes and so on. There is obviously uncertainty about outcomes of actions, uh, non-deterministic actions, and there is also uncertainty that I'll get to uh, later on that relates to interactions with other agents uh, and, and uh, uh, the lack of uh, global or, or shared view of, of, of uh, or knowledge of, of the, the uh, state of the plan and the goal and so on. And then there is a whole range of, of uh, uncertainty that comes from the perception, uh, either because sensors are imperfect or provide partial information. So we will talk about many of these uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with a, a view of the system that is a, performing actions that are trying to modify the environment in a particular way and um, observe the outcomes. Initially, we'll, we'll assume that, that the state of the world is fully observable. We'll look at situations where the agent operates over some extended period of time, maybe uh, uh, unlike classical planning in, in when there is uncertainty and uh, when you take an action and there is some chance that you don't, nothing happens. Obviously, at that point, you, you may not guarantee with probability one that you reach the goal uh, w with any number of, of trials. So you need to deal with uh, longer horizon, maybe infinite horizon plans, which again complicates things. So the foundation for th the work that I'm going to talk about is the Markov decision process, a model that was originally introduced in, in control theory and operations research in, in the 1950s and has become the uh, centerpiece of uh, uh, probabilistic planning and also reinforcement learning, as many of you know. And we're looking at the discrete state spaces. A lot of these things were relaxed and extended, but in this, in this uh, tutorial, I will focus on discrete actions and discrete state spaces. And we have a transition model that tells us the probability of any outcome state. And, and then we have a reward function uh, that's a, a pretty flexible language to describe the objective. The reward can be associated with some states. You just may have a goal state with a reward one and all the other states may have a reward zero. Or you may have uh, some reward or negative reward associated with each action to represent the cost of the action and so on. And there is the mark of assumption that uh, uh, is uh, that, that the um, dynamics of the system are independent of the history. So the, pro the probability distribution of future states uh, at time t depends on the state at time t and the action taken and is independent of the how you got there. So, so how limiting is this? This is the foundation of Markov decision processes. It's a big assumption. Uh, how limiting is it? Any, any uh, concern? So as many of you probably know, um, we don't have any restriction on what the state may be. So if it depends on some limited history, that can be folded into the state. And if it depends on the entire history, that can be in principle folded into the state. But then you run into complexity issues. So in many cases, we approximate processes that maybe are not perfectly Markov using some state that is uh, sufficiently predictive, but not maybe uh, satisfying the assumption perfectly. Uh, the performance criteria is equally interesting and maybe the, uh, another restriction in Markov decision processes that most people don't pay too much attention to and is more restrictive than uh, the, the Markov assumption about the state dynamics is the uh, performance criteria. Uh, we generally want to maximize uh, some combination of rewards we get in each step. And, and uh, if we have a, a situation where we have a, a finite number of states, we have a deadline, we can only operate over 10 states, what do we do now depend on how many steps remain? And in that case, we say that the policy or the plan is non-stationary in the sense that in, different, in, in the same state, you would take different actions depending on how much time is left. If there's enough uh, 
time to try to get to the most valuable goal. Maybe we'll go that way. But if there are only two steps left and there is some other goal nearby, you should go towards that goal. So um, the infinite horizon problem in uh, kind of uh, paradoxically is, is in some ways uh, simpler, at, at least in the sense that the best policy is stationary. What you do depend on your state, period. It doesn't, because you always have an infinite horizon ahead of you. And whenever you get to that state, perhaps again unintentionally, you're faced with the same problem you were uh, before. So what I meant to say about the performance criteria that there is actually another kind of less known assumption about Markov processes that the preference of an agent, if you look at the a general process, you may take a bunch of action and generate a trajectory. Uh, and when you operate under uncertainty, your plan can generate a, any number of different trajectories depending on how execution unfolds. And the value of that experience depends on the entire history in some non-trivial way. If you're enrolled in a, at a university and you take some classes and you pass some and you don't pass others and so on, perhaps you get some pleasure uh, f by, by taking any one class, but you really want to graduate and it all needs to add up to something to give you enough credits and so on. So you can't just say that you enjoyed some classes and you didn't enjoy other classes and the cumulative reward is the sum of those. Rewards, you need to look at whether you satisfied some requirement and you achieved the goal. And the goal may depend in some cases on, on, on the history in a non-trivial way. So the other assumption that is shown here is that the preference, we're going to make an assumption that the preference of the agent over histories is also independent of the past if the futures look the same. Um, uh, in other words, uh, if, if at one point um, you prefer from state S0 one particular sequence, you prefer that sequence regardless of, regardless of the fact that you were in state zero. So apparently that assumption leads to um, the following situation where the only way to combine rewards and satisfy that is to have cumulative rewards or discounted cumulative rewards. Meaning that in, in the Markov process, the overall utility is the sum of the rewards you get per step. And that is somewhat limiting, but again, remember, the state can be anything. So if the state can memorize any amount of history, the rewards that depend on the state can be postponed until the end and they may depend on that entire history. So there's always a way to take a process that doesn't satisfy that and create a new mark of process that satisfies that, that is exponentially larger state space and that's not necessarily what we want. Okay, yeah. The, the assumption uh, about the, the preference is that if you uh, look at two histories that start in the same state, and perhaps you went through a couple of uh, similar states, and, and then you had a particular divergence. Uh, one went this way and the other, and one went the other way. If you prefer one of those complete histories over the other, it must be me that, you pr that it is because you prefer that, that later sequence, the utility of that sequence that came after the, the initial state or after a sequence of states that are the same. So all things being equal, you prefer longer histories that, that end in a particular sequence only if you prefer that later sequence. Um, meaning that, that, that it's kind of in, independent of that, it's, it's, not, uh, it's detached from that, that context if you want. The context is how you got to that sequence. Yes? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. And discounting has been introduced in mark of decision processes in a large part. Be this type of discounting was introduced because it allows a lot of math to work nicely and to prove convergence in the limit and all sorts of things and bound the value loss if you perform one way or, or, or another. The only way to motivate, so, so, so that's why that is predominantly used. Um, no, other, what kind of uh, uh, discounting are you thinking about? 
Yeah. So apparently it must be one of uh, uh, this kind of discounting to satisfy the assumption. It must be this form. But discounting was introduced not necessarily, I mean, there is a, a good motivation for discounting, obviously, if uh, your agent collects uh, and recycles cans and, and you deposit these cans in a machine and you look at different days, uh, a dollar earned tomorrow is less value than a dollar earned today because of interest rates and so on, but that's not the kind of discounting we're using here. And it's, we're not necessarily looking. So if you have a, some service, an operating system, is it fair to say that a task that is completed tomorrow is less valuable than the task that is completed today? Or uh, not, not completely. So um, there has been a lot of interesting work actually on looking instead of, so, so the reason for discounting, to put it simply, in processes that are not uh, guaranteed to terminate within a f fixed number of states, um, any process that goes uh, with infinite horizon will have unbounded reward. How do we compare two different alternatives and say this is the optimal and this is suboptimal if both have infinite reward? Uh, when you have infinite reward, it doesn't really matter what you do today, tomorrow, and next week there, because uh, everything is the same. Discounting puts more emphasis on the next few steps you perform and immediately makes uh, the sums are finite and you compare one over the other and you can say this is optimal and this is not. But in many cases the discount factor to uh, be, to be f um, honest is, is, is selected pretty arbitrarily, 0 0.9, 0 0.99. And we know that the discount factor is affecting the plan. If you use 0 0.9, the best plan may be to get out of the room and take, go left. And for 0 0.95, it may be to go right. So it's kind of weird that some mechanism that is just guaranteeing convergence and other nice property is affecting what you do. There is a whole, uh, al there is an alternative to discounting, not different discounting, but there is an alternative and that's the average reward model. So you can say, I want to optimize the average reward over <coughs> per time step uh, with no discounting it solves the problem of, of, you know, if you operate over infinite horizon, you can still talk about average reward per time step, and this plan is better than that plan. And there is uh, much less work. It's a lot more complicated, but there's been some work that, that, that I've done with my students. Sridhar Mahadevan has done some nice work on how to solve Markov decision processes and optimize average reward over infinite horizons, and in some ways it's a more satisfying criteria. Okay, so uh, this is just a simple, a uh, great example to give an example and to ground what we're going to talk about in the algorithms. Um, uh, many, many of the examples are kind of grid worlds in which you, you move and you want to approach a particular goal state let's say the plus one, or there is another state that is terminal state with a minus one. At that point, the process terminates. And what we assume here is that each time you try to move in a certain direction, up, down, left, right, uh, you, you succeed with probability 0 0.8 and, f and move sideways with probability 0 0.1 each in each way, uh, if it's possible. Otherwise, you stay in your location if that is either outside the domain or there is a blocked obstacle, uh, there's an obstacle uh, in your way and so on. So if you look at it, the optimal plan is shown here uh, and um, you can see th the errors represent the best action in each state and what you see in the, uh, in the other table is the expected utility if you execute that plan. What is that expected utility? It's not the immediate reward. The immediate reward is actually, I didn't tell you, but each time you execute an action there is a small cost, let's say 0. 0.4 or something like that, I think, in this case. And um, when you get to plus one, you get the plus one and the process terminates. And what you want to look at is if I'm in a particular state and I execute this particular policy, the optimal policy, and I try that many times, what would be my expected reward? And these are the numbers you, you see here, and we'll see how you calculate these numbers and um, how you, um, once you have these numbers, remember, they represent the value of optimal action uh, over all possible trajectories. So actually, if you have these values, it's pretty easy to know what to do. You look at each state and you say, if I go up, 
there's three possible outcomes in the worst case, there may be less. I can move sideways or in the direction that I want with certain probabilities. Each one of these would lead to a particular state with a certain expected utility. I can compute the expected value of what's called one step look ahead and, and, and that gives you the best action, the action that has the best value just using one step. Once you have these numbers, but we'll see how you calculate these numbers. The other thing to notice is that the same problem can actually have a lot of policies that are optimal, optimal if you just change a very small uh, part of the setting, let's say just the cost of actions. If the cost of action, if you look at these, these four uh, little tables showing different policies, the, uh, the one on the, on, the, on the top right represent actions that are ne quite negative, um, meaning the actions are so costly, it's better to rush towards one of the goal states and end the process, where, where, but it's still beneficial to seek the plus one. So you can see that we're next to the minus one, we're giving it a shot, we're trying to go up to get to the plus one. If you look at the top left one, the actions are even more costly. The cost of action is 1.6 something or more. At, the, at that point, the best policy is to end the misery as soon as possible. Just rush to one of the goal state doesn't matter if it's one or minus one because each action costs more than that, more than one. Uh, so, so you can see that the policy is, is to do exactly that. If the reward is positive, that's the bottom right, you see that you're trying to avoid, with probability one, getting to those terminal states because you're collecting reward uh, indefinitely and um, and uh, you, you don't want to stop that. And you can see that that is what's happening. And then there is a range of rewards where the policy, that's quite interesting, the actions have minuscule cost. So there you really want to maximize the chances of getting to the plus one. So when you are next to the minus one and there is a possibility of ending there, you take an action that would guarantee with probability one that you will not get there. You try to walk towards the wall, and then with small probability you will move up or down, but at least you know you will not get into the minus one. And the actions are so cheap, you can, you can give it a try. So what is the conclusion of this? The conclusion of this is that you can't look at the problem, like a deterministic problem, and figure out the plan. It's not intuitive. You need to crunch the numbers. And the policy may look very different if you just change the action cost by a little bit. So that, that's an interesting observation. So the utility of a state, as I said, is the utility, the reward to go. What happens from now on if I ex uh, execute the optimal policy? That is the, well, you can, you can take an arbitrary policy and evaluate it, but the utility U star is the utility of the optimal policy. And how do we compute that? So it's based on um, the following observation. The utility of a state is connected to the utility of neighboring state using what's called the Bellman equation. The utility of state S is the immediate reward you get, the, you get for RS, for, for visiting it, plus the discount factor times the expected reward from there on, which is the max over all actions and, and, and computing the, the expected utility of an action using that one step look ahead and, and looking at the utility of all the state S prime that you can reach. Assuming that you know uh, uh, the utility of S and the utility of S prime. So if you don't know them, uh, what Bellman showed is that the optimal policy needs to satisfy that and he showed that if you actually use that as an update rule, if you start from any utility estimates, let's say zero for all states, or you can estimate the utility of a state using its initial, its immediate reward. So if a state has a reward of one, you can say that's the initial estimate. But then you use this equation as an update rule. Bellman showed a couple of things. First is that the error, the maximum error, the difference between the estimated utility and the real utility goes down by at least a factor of gamma in, 
for, for, every, for, for, uh, for every state. And the other thing that he showed that this process convergence on a single fixed point, which is the optimal value function, and that gave rise to the value iteration algorithm that was introduced in 57 and quite a lot of follow-up work on Markov decision processes, which essentially use the Bellman equations as an update rule until u and u primes are close enough. Now, most people just use some epsilon, but there are actually, there is a very rich theory. Um, I think I may have some, some of it here, but uh, you can actually say, uh, develop both offline bounds and online bounds. The, the offline bounds tell you, if you run this update rule for 1,000 times, what's the worst case error? And the online bounds are more interesting because the offline bounds are pretty loose. It may tell you that you will have, in the worst case, a certain error, but you will actually be much closer. So instead, you can use the actual um, worst case difference between any two utility functions in an updates and use those online in order to estimate and bound your error. There's a lot of work on error bounds. I will skip that right now. Uh, one thing to notice is that what you see here on the left is a graph for that particular grid world showing the utility of each state. They all start from zero, except the goal ones that start from plus one and minus one. So they're initialized to the R of S. And then as you run these updates um, 30 times, you see how pretty quickly, maybe after 10 updates, it's kind of converging to the optimal values and stays there. But that all looks great. That was done probably with discount factor of let's say 0 0.9. That's actually a pretty significant discount factor. And that uh, helps, again, convergence of value iteration. What you see on the, in the other graph is how the number of iterations needed to reach a certain error bound grow as you change the discount factor from 0 0.5 to very close to one. And what you see is that the process convergence after a dozen or two dozen iterations um, with discount factors like 0 0.7 or even 0 0.9. But as you get very close to one, value iteration converges very slowly. And generally, it is considered a very uh, inefficient algorithm. And there are many improvements that were developed. I'll mention a couple of them. But one thing to notice is that long before the values of the states are the correct ones, they give you enough guidance on what actions to choose. So you're already choosing the correct actions, but you're just look, waiting for the process to converge, estimating the right values. So one thing you can do is evaluate the policy that you have right now precisely and use those values as opposed to uh, using the value iteration updates. And that led to the introduction of the policy iteration algorithms. In policy iteration, you do search over in policy space. So you start with a random policy and you improve the policy in each sta step. You, what's the initial policy? Well, in the basic algorithm, you just assign a random action to each state, a random action. You can do better if you, for example, um, We'll talk a little bit about how you can use deterministic versions of probabilistic models in order to solve them or accelerate things. So you can s uh, use the action that is the best action for the determinization of the problem and so on, and that would be near optimal in many cases and so on. But you can just uh, initialize it with a random action. Evaluating a policy involves, again, solving something like the Bellman equations. Value determination is what you see on this slide but you don't use the max <coughs> operator because you don't choose the action. The action is fixed. It's the policy action. So you get a set of actually linear equations where the variables, the unknowns, are the utilities of the states. And the probability of transitions, the model we assume is known. And um, so we have basically, if we have a state space with whatever, 100 states, we have 100 equations with 100 unknowns, linear equations. We know how to solve that. And uh, you can also use value iteration over that, and, and that's sometimes used in. Once you have the values, the exact or approximate values of the policy, you can then um, uh, choose new actions 
based on these values. You can use the one-step look at and say, well, these new value estimates, and here is a nice thing about policy iteration, where now the number of policies is finite. And in each step, you're guaranteed to either conclude that there is no state for which you can choose a better action, in which case you prove convergence. You have a policy, and you cannot change the action in any state in order to get better value. That actually indicates that this is the optimal policy and the value, and optimal policy, there can be multiple ones, and the value that you calculated of that policy is the optimal value function. So if that happens, you have a real test of convergence, the determination. And the other possibility is that you improved some actions. So what was shown is that this process only improves the value of actions. It doesn't matter. If you move one, improve the value of one state because of that, it only propagates and improves the values of other states. So what happens is that in each step you, where you change some actions, the value of the policy goes up. It means it's a distinct new policy. It, you cannot go in cycles and get back to an old policy that, in the search. And since the process is doing search in a finite state space, it, it actually terminates with the optimal policy. It turns to work faster, and, um, and many algorithms use the, the, the benefit of search in policy space, but not necessarily doing this over the entire state space because that's the very, very efficient. So uh, at this point, I want to talk a little bit about uh, work that we've done in our lab that connects uh, classical planning and search with a mark of decision processes. Uh, the classical kind of work on MDPs was based on matrices, number crunching, you basically take the entire state space and you run these updates on it until you find what's called a universal plan. A plan that tells you what you, could, you would do in any possible state in the state space. One of the nice things about classical planning that you may have noticed already is yes, it uses a naive version of the model of the world and it doesn't allow for uncertainty, but you can represent the world using a factored representation that uh, can capture state spaces with billions or trillions of states, but you can still take advantage of the fact that in planning, usually you have an initial state, maybe known, fixed initial state, and you're not trying to plan what to do in any possible state of the world. You just want to find the plan from that state to a goal state. And with the right heuristics, algorithms like A star can solve that problem very quickly because they don't need to visit the entire state space. And if you look even at some puzzles like uh, Rubik's Cubes and so on, the state spaces are enormous. You can still find a plan uh, to using A star with a, a good heuristic. So how can we benefit from that uh, when we solve MDPs? And it's really a, a particular class of M MDPs that's been uh, attracting a lot of attention is it's more relevant for planning. Uh, they're called stochastic shortest path problems, and they represent a particular class of problems where each action has a cost, and what we want to do is to minimize the cost to the goal, just like we did in classical planning. Find a plan that perhaps has the minimum cost to the goal. So each action has a cost, but the only difference is that when we take an action, there could be multiple outcomes, and we have the probabilities of these outcomes. So the best way to think about it is looking at this diagram. In search in, in general, in A star, for example, we are searching in, in, in a search space that we never represent explicitly as a table or as a matrix. It's an imaginary state space. We call it the implicit graph. It's defined by an initial state and a function that can generate successors. So you know from each state I can tell you what's the neighboring states in that graph. But I never give you the entire graph, and I don't want to ever generate this, and I don't have, may not have enough storage for it, and in fact, we will be able to solve problems for which all the computers on Earth cannot be uh, representing the entire graph. So we have this nice property that we have an initial state and we can generate successors, and we just want to find a plan to get to the, to the uh, goal. And obviously in the course of searching for that plan, particularly if we want to have the optimal plan, we may need to explore the search space a little bit. So we call the explicit graph um, 
uh, the part of the search space that is generated to find the solution. And finally, the solution graph is the part of the state uh, space that is part of the optimal solution. Now, if you think about A star deterministic planning, that solution graph looks like a sequence of actions. Uh, so that is uh, what, what we see first. Um, in contingent planning over finite horizon, we can solve these problems using algorithms like AO star. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you, we'll mention a few things about it. It's, it's basically a situation where when you take an action, there could be multiple outcomes, and you need to plan for each one of those. It's, it's considered sometimes an end or graph because you choose an action, that's an or node, you optimize when you, you have the right to choose an action, but you, you need to plan for any outcome, so that's an end node. Um, and there, there's been an extension of, of A star to, to end or graphs that um, I will not talk too much about because LAO star extends that even further uh, to situation where you, you have uh, MDPs or SSPs with indefinite horizon. Indefinite horizon, in case you haven't heard about it, is, is kind of, a, it extends both finite and infinite horizon. It's a situation where we don't know how many steps we may need and there is no bound to get to the goal, but with probability one, we can get to the goal. So if you have a plan, move forward, and just ahead of you, there is a goal, but with probability 50%, you succeed, and with probability 50%, nothing happens, you have an indefinite horizon plan. And uh, the number of steps that it may, you may need in order to get to the goal is unbounded, but the expected number of steps is, is it two? Something like that. With, with, uh, with, pro with probability one half, you will finish in one step, and one quarter, two steps, and so on. So, um, so I, I think it's a, a small finite number. In any case, LAO star allows us to represent the explicit solution as a <laughs> contingent plan with cycles. And we will see what, what the challenges it presents. It's actually a very straightforward ex extension of, of A star in a way. So I'm going to skip the uh, AO, AO star and, and go straight to LAO star and, and talk to you about how it generates the, the graph uh, and, and how it evaluates states and decides what to do next. So it starts like A star with an initial state and it expands, expands the nodes on the frontier like A star. And it assigns an F value to each state in the following way. If a state is a goal node, the cost to get to a goal is zero, obviously, so it, the cost is zero. We are now assuming uh, for simplicity that there could be multiple states that are goal nodes and certainly multiple paths to goal nodes. Uh, the goal itself, uh, at the goal the process terminates and the cost is zero. So if you are evaluating a tip node that is a non-goal node, you use a heuristic value, HI, to assign a cost estimate. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, how do you come up with heuristic? I, I don't know if you talk about it, in this tutorial about how to come up with heuristic for A star, but there are a lot of uh, techniques that, w yeah, yeah, and, and, and abstractions and, and um, pattern databases and so on. Uh, all this carries over to the deterministic case in most cases. In many cases, planning under uncertainty involves simply some chance that your action fails. And when it fails, nothing good happens. Of course, the failure may be that you move the three steps in towards the goal instead of one step, but you always need to take kind of the, be the, the, the best case scenario when you use the heuristic. The heuristic is, is always, so, so that's fine too. You can use the actual distance to the goal, the deterministic distance, and if in the best case you move three steps, you divide it by three and you get an admissible heuristic. But in most cases actually the, the deterministic cost is, is an, an optimistic estimate. And there are other, other ways to generate heuristics. So you use a heuristic, and for any other internal state, non-tip node, the tip nodes are on the frontier of this graph, that they've no successors. All the other nodes, you simply evaluate it by, we're now minimizing cost instead of maximizing reward because it's an SSP, but it's just the equivalent. So we minimize over all actions, the immediate cost for the action plus 
the probabilities you will end up in the state J times the utility of FJ. So what you see here, we defined some value function over the entire states in the explicit graph that was uh, generated, uh, the, F, uh, the F values, it's like the F values in, in A star, and they're defined this way. The problem is F of state I may depends of F of the state J and vice versa. In A star and in A of star, you can use backward inductions. You move backwards and uh, upwards in the tree, and the state of a parent depends on the state of a child. In, in A star, it's simply the, the G value plus the, you know, the cost of the next action is the G value of the next action and so on. But here we have these circular things. When you take an action, you may get unintentionally to a state you already visited, and from that state you got to this state as well. So you have these circular dependencies. Uh, how do we solve that? Well, one thing you can do is run value iteration on the explicit graph. So maybe your graph, your state space has billions of states, but you start, just started the search and now you have 100 states. You can run value iteration on that. So remember, tip nodes have their own values, heuristic, goal nodes are zero. And the internal one, you use this update and you use just value iteration and you don't need to run it until convergence. One of the key results in this area that was introduced by Andy Barto. In, in reinforcement learning, but very relevant to this because uh, the difference between reinforcement learning and, and probabilistic planning is, is non-existent, uh, particularly in the model, um, in, in the case where you assume that you know the model. Reinforcement learning also allows you to learn the model. But, um, and they show that asynchronous updates, meaning you can update any state as many times as you want, if upon convergence, the convergence test is that you ran this, this update sufficiently, then you are guaranteed it, and, and you're always making progress. So it opened up a lot of, uh, um, um, it, it, it was the foundation for lots of interesting algorithms like prioritized sweeping where you don't run value iterations on the entire thing. You, you updated something, you expanded this area, maybe you should update just states that are reachable from that area or, 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 or the neighborhood and so on. There are all kinds of techniques to very quickly identify those. But in, in any case, you can just run systematically value iteration on the entire graph, it's a small graph. And as it grows, it turns out that using an admissible heuristic, the algorithm will converge to an optimal policy without uh, necessarily expanding all the states. The other nice uh, property, similar to A star, if the heuristic is more informative, it generally would lead to less work, but it's stated here precisely. Um, so um, some of the early work was done on this um, uh, racetrack problem. I don't know if you've uh, heard about it. I will get back to it again. It's a problem that looks at a, at, at a vehicle moving on a grid wall, except the vehicle is modeled uh, a little bit more accurately than just the jump from state to state. At any given time, it has a speed, uh, velocity, in the, along the x and y directions, and your actions are to increase. You can accelerate or decelerate. In some cases, you can only do it by one unit. Um, and um, what you want to do is to navigate maybe some turns and so on. You can add some probability of slipping and so on uh, in, the, in the transition model, and you can get a, a more reasonable and accurate kind of uh, model for how to control a moving um, a vehicle at some speed and taking into account the, the acceleration, deceleration as actions and not just the jumps from state to state. So it's a nice, it's a nice problem. And uh, what you want to do is to get to the finish line as soon as possible, obviously, or to a, go a goal state. And um, so uh, before I, I show you the results for that, there is also a very interesting uh, way to decompose the value function. I only gave you the F values, but you know, in A star, each node has an F value that is decomposed into a G, the cost to get to that node from the start, and H, which is the estimate for that node all the way to the goal. And the sum of the two is the F value. Here, we didn't actually define it that way. It turns out that in LAO star, you can also decompose the F values into G and H values. It's a little tricky, so I'll say it quickly. And uh, if you get it, that's fine. If not, don't worry. Maybe you look at the paper. But we have the paper and the code 
uh, available. I'll talk a little bit about some libraries that you can use if you're interested in this. So the G value is the cost uh, to get from the start state to the, fr uh, to the fringe of the, of the best partial solution graph. And the H value of each node is the cost to get to the, um, it, to, to get to the, uh, from the, from the fringe to the goal. Except if you're in a certain internal state, it's H value it needs to factor the fact that as you continue the, uh, the plan, the op if you execute the optimal plan so far, there's a certain probability you'll get to the fringe of the partial solution graph. It may be different states. And for each one, there will be different remaining cost to the goal, different H values. So it's the average of these factored by the probabilities. So it's, it's written here. And the nice thing about this decomposition, it allows us to use weighted heuristic functions. Did you talk about weighted heuristics for A star? It's a trick that allows us to um, accelerate planning in real time situations and compromise in a bounded way and in a controlled way, how much far from optimal we want to be. So generally, if you have a heuristic function and you have two nodes and one is, they both have an F value, a total solution cost estimate of 21. They look equally good. A normal algorithm will choose among them at random. But if you look at one node more closely and you see that that node has an H value of two, the other one has an H value of seven, Two means that you're very close to a goal. And usually, the error in the heuristic grows with its value. So you know that if you have a limited amount of time, probably the one with two would end up in a solution sooner. And it actually may be a better solution because of the error in the heuristic estimate. So you want to bias your algorithm a little bit towards nodes that have lower heuristic value, all things being equal. Actually, just doing that, breaking ties during using the lower H value would improve your algorithm significantly. But you can go one step further and say, well, maybe 22, cost 22 with a heuristic of 2 is better than 21 with a heuristic of 7 or 11. And that's exactly what the weighted heuristic does. Your F values use some weight of G and H, not equal weights. And as you move that weight from 0 0.5 would give you just A star, the way it works usually. But as you move the weight higher towards one, you neglect the cost of G and you become more and more, well, greedy. You basically say, I'm going to put more emphasis on the distance from here to the goal uh, because maybe I don't have enough time to explore all the different parts. Turns out that the, the, depending on W and depending on the actual, you can have offline bounds. That's the one mentioned here. And there is also an online bound that you can very easily uh, compute if you run a star. Obviously, if you found a solution and the solution has a cost, uh, let's say 20, you know that, that uh, the best solution is, is, is can be either between 20 and the best F value, not this, the admissible one without weights in the, in the open list. The least one is the, is, the, is the best possible solution you may find. So if the least one using the admissible heuristic is 17, you know that, and you stop the algorithm, you know that you're risking not finding a solution that is a little bit better. So, so you can actually have a control over this. So the interesting thing is once you have these, th this decomposition into G and H and you put the weight, you can do the same thing in LAO star. And this is some initial results from the original paper uh, running on the racetrack problem. So you can see, um, and, and this is a trend on a very small problem from what, what was done um, nearly 20 years ago um, or 18. You see the value iteration explore all states and takes 15.7 second, seconds to converge. If you do run LAO star with zero heuristic, you don't really have a heuristic, you just benefit from the reachability, limited reachability. Some states are not reachable at all, regardless of what you do. Um, then you get an optimal plan in 10.7 seconds and some fewer states. If you use the Dijkstra heuristic, which is the shortest deterministic path, uh, you get an, uh, the optimal plan after 4.7 seconds. 
If you start using a weighted heuristic, you can get the optimal plan after 3.1 seconds, or within 1.8 seconds, you get a plan that is 4% of optimal with an even higher weight. So, and, and you can see that the number of nodes evaluated is, is going down. So th there has been some very interesting phenomena that was discovered that um, uh, with LAO star since then, and there's been uh, a lot of interesting questions on that I didn't get into uh, relating to search control. Okay, I told you everything about how the algorithm works except for one thing. What parts of the frontier of the solution graph you, 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 ex you explore next, expand? In A star, you take a node with the least F value, but here we have lots of nodes you can reach <coughs> by the optimal partial, you know, current solution. Which one of them? And you can say, well, maybe the entire frontier of the best solution, or maybe the most reachable part of the optimal solution. You can look at reachability, or maybe just one node at a time. And so people try different versions, and there is an algorithm called improved LAO star that has been trying to use um, uh, additional mechanisms to accelerate that and so on. So there's been some follow-up work that improved the algorithm, and we have a very nice, efficient implementation available online that I'll mentioned. So at this point, uh, I, before switching gears, maybe pause for uh, any more questions about um, solving. Yes. That's a, that's a good question, uh, and, and there isn't really a good answer to that, except that to try a few and for, for any given problem. One thing you can do is use something very close to 0 0.5 and, and just if you use 0.51, for example, you will be very, you saw that here 0 0.6 gave you the optimal solution actually, even 0 0.6. Uh, you can try a few. The good thing is that you can compute what, whatever weight you use, um, the algorithm is an any, that you get is an anytime algorithm. You don't need to stop when you, when you, you know, at any particular time, you can wait until you, you don't have the, any nodes on the frontier of the, the graph based on the admissible heuristic that is presenting a better alternative. Let me explain that a little bit better. At any given time, you may find a complete plan using a weight, right? But if you look at that plan and you look at the action selected for each state, it may not be the optimal action once you use the admissible heuristic. There may be a better alternative that you didn't even explore far. But if there isn't, you know that you're optimal. And if there is, the value estimate of that alternative gives you a bound on what, how, how much better it can be. So, so at least you have that feedback. And when you decide to stop, you, you can decide to stop because A, you know it's optimal, or you know it's within 4% of optimal. So at least you have that. Now you may pr uh, try a particular, um, you, you can try aggressively with let's say 0 0.7, and you may find that you, it terminates and it gives you pretty bad plans, so you would try that. Uh, there has been some interesting work on dynamic weights, meaning, and that's really interesting, um, you start with a certain weight that's very close to let's say 0 0.5, but as you get closer and closer to the anticipated termination, maybe you have a deadline, you want to start moving and to take action, uh, you, it's like pressing on the acceleration gas. You increase the weight, you basically, it's like at the end, when, when you're taking an exam and it's really getting close to the deadline, you just want to finish a couple of questions that you almost did, you don't want to look at the others, it has that effect. It emphasizes things that are very near in terms of the goal and not exploring the rest. So you can kind of press on the acceleration gas and figure, uh, just explore quickly the parts that, that give you quick solutions. Yes? The, the zero heuristic is admissible, so it is guaranteed to give you the uh, optimal policy. Uh, the surprising thing is that y it, it doesn't say, you would say, well, but what's the saving? The saving is that you're doing now, you're not exploring part of the state space that are not reachable. If, in, 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 let's say in the racetrack problem. You cannot reach 
for example, the state that is immediately after the initial state with speed seven, because you accelerate at one step at a time, right? So many combinations of locations and speeds are not feasible from the initial state. There are states that are not reachable at all, like that one, and there are states that are not reachable by the optimal policy. And the algorithm benefits from, from uh, this kind of uh, limited reachability. Now, in some problem domains, all states are reachable. For example, if you take an action and you're on a grid, and with small probability you can jump anywhere in the world, then these algorithms will not be that beneficial. They really benefit from limited reachability, the locality. A robot, if it moves and there is an error, it's not going to jump to the next room. There is some locality of the error. Uh, in, in problems where that's not satisfied, um, and many, or all states are reachable, maybe from every single state. Well, that's a hard, these are hard problems to solve generally, but uh, that's the main factor that, that helps these algorithms. Even with heuristic zero, you, limit, you benefit from the limited reachability. The weights, um, the weights don't give you an optimal policy guaranteed. You, but in retrospect, you can check if it's optimal. So if you use a weight that is very close to 0.5, in that case it was 0.6 actually, it happened to be that it was the optimal and we could verify that easily upon termination, but it's not guaranteed. Yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so a tip state is simply a state that is not a goal and it has not been, been expended yet. Now, if you think about A star, many people think about a search tree, in which case it's very clear. The frontier, the fringe of that tree is the frontier and all the internal states were generated and expended are, are the, the other states. But in our case, we don't represent, in LAO star doesn't represent the graph as, as, a, as a tree because it's not really a tree, it's a graph. It is cycles, every state can point to whatever successors. It's actually a very simple representation. It's, it's using typically a hash table so that you can get to each state that you generate directly. There is only one copy of each state. Each state is either, is either new or previously generated and not expended, in which case it's a tip node, or previously generated and already expended, in which case it's an internal state. Okay, so good, other questions? So I want to talk a little bit about the idea of uh, solving probabilistic models using reduced models. The idea of taking a, a, a problem and solving a version of the problem that is simplified is, is very old. In fact, that's what we do all the time. Uh, the model that we use in planning is already greatly simplified. But there's been also a lot of interest in saying, suppose that that's the problem, that is the problem, and it is computationally expensive to solve. How can we solve the problem uh, that is uh, simpler than that and still get plans that are quite effective. And there's been work going all the way back to the 90s uh, on, on uh, various forms of, of approximation and partitioning and so on. But I want to talk about some more recent work that um, paradoxically uh, was, was quite effective and um, you should all be very familiar with it. So you can take a probabilistic problem and determinize it, meaning create a deterministic version of it. Now, if you're part of the ICAPS community, it's a pretty easy process because most of the initial benchmarks were created by taking a deterministic problem and making it probabilistic by assuming all sorts of other things can happen. So you can undo these assumptions and you, you know, so you, you have the, the, the probabilistic blocks world, you can take the blocks world and so on. But um, there, there are, uh, even if you start with a truly uh, a, a, a probabilistic problems, there are now systematic ways to compute a determinization. 
Uh, the most common one is to just look at the most likely outcome or the most desired outcome or the most, uh, if you want to be, uh, uh, follow Murphy law, Murphy's laws and you can always say the most uh, undesired outcome or, or some, some other uh, versions. There is also work that has been using determinization, what's called all outcome determinization. It means that if an action can generate three possible outcomes, you, you create new actions, A1, A2, and A3, that can generate deterministically each one of these outcomes. It's very easy to show that when you plan with either the most desired outcome or in all outcome determinization, the deterministic plan that you generate would have a, 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 a cost that is lower than the real cost because it's the, it's the best the best possible scenario. But with the progress that's been um, made in deterministic planning, you can find that plan not in seconds or milliseconds, in microseconds. It, you can solve a lot of these problems very quickly. The question is, what can we do with that? And the initial planner that seemed very, very naive but was extremely successful, it was the winner of the first probabilistic planning competition, FF Replan, by Jörg Hoffman, um, was doing this. You solve the determinization and you execute these actions until at one point an outcome occurs that is not in the plan. You don't have a plan from there. You try to move forward, you move sideways, it wasn't part of the plan. So you just replan because that's so fast, you just replan from there and you continue. Of course, there are some risks associated with it when you do uh, deterministic planning, you ignore some outcomes. Those outcomes may be very unlikely, but extremely dangerous. There may be other plans that avoid them altogether. So it's, it's, it's not always um, uh, completely uh, the, the greatest idea, but the fact is that it won, uh, it was the winner of the first uh, planning competition that had versions of LAO star and other smart algorithms, all the best algorithms for probabilistic planning. And this was doing so well uh, that well, it, was, it was kind of surprising, but it led to some interest in uh, doing some work on that. We, we, I'll show you some result of solving racetrack problems like this one, uh, using determinization and so on. But one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to mention, and I'll just mention it briefly, is that you don't need to go all the way from a full model to deterministic model. And in this particular work, we, we define some uh, middle ground. You can say, I'm going to allow more than one outcome. Uh, maybe two outcomes out of eight are allowed per actions. You're still going to reduce the complexity of the problem significantly. The other thing that we did in this work is to allow a fixed and small number of actions to have the full model. What does that mean? We call the outcomes that are part of the reduced model um, the, the, the primary and all the other outcomes are considered exceptions. So when you move forward, maybe moving sideways is an exception. But we're not ignoring those exceptions completely. We're ignoring them largely. We're going to say that we're now going to create a plan that will allow one exception to happen. So at any given time from now on, I am actually planning for moving sideways, but after moving sideways one, I'm not going to allow that to happen anymore. But I'm kind of, uh, going to count, or maybe twice. I have a certain fixed bound on the number of exceptions I'm willing to entertain. It turns out that you can get much more robust, reduced models of plans that are not purely determinization, and I'll show you just some of the results, and because I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, I don't have the results. I may have hidden some of these slides. Um, oh no, it's coming with the continual planning and it's combined, combined with that. And, and I want to, yeah, that's an that's a important part of the, how, how these, these things are evaluated. So, so th that's actually an important point. When you have different planners that offer different trade-offs, like the one that I just mentioned, determinization, um, when something bad happens, 
you don't have any action available. And that's not good. It's not good for a variety of reasons. First of all, you're going, you're, you're going to now stop and plan. And the other, the other thing is that you may be in the middle of an intersection or you, you, you know, it may not be the best time to do planning. But you can actually avoid that, particularly if your planner is very fast. So let's say you use the FF replan and you, you actually have a deterministic plan and you're about to execute the first action in that plan. You never plan with more complex model. But you're allowed to say, okay, while I'm executing that, plan, that, that first action, I know that there are two other outcomes that I ignored. I'm going to quickly generate, before they happen, in a proactive way, deterministic plans for them. And if you can do that, and, and in fact, you know, with FF replan, you can do that because it's, it's microseconds. On the fly, as you get to a state and you're about to execute another, another action, turn right, you, you already planned, create deterministic plans for all the different outcomes, for each one of the outcomes, in a proactive way. And that you will not have to stop. But if you look at the full range of this problem, it has to do already with how you interleave planning and execution, which is an important topic, and I'm not going to do justice to that, but it's, it's really important. The most simple thing is what you see in the first curve here, A, where you have a planner, and you spend a certain amount of time finding the plan, let's say the best plan, an optimal plan, and then you execute that plan, and the completion time is shown there. It takes a substantial amount of time, even though the execution cost or time was minimized, but planning time was very substantial. The other option, B, is basically saying, let's find an approximate plan and execute that plan. The plan is not optimal, it's a bit longer, the red is a bit longer, but the planning time is significantly reduced. The overall completion time goes down. So that's a reasonable, uh, a, re a good reason to use approximate planning. And in fact, there is some work um, that I've done on finding the right time to stop planning and start executing if you use an anytime algorithm that can be interrupted so that the combined cost would be minimized. But then you can do what C shows is pretty close to what determinization does. You derive a plan and then you execute it, but that plan cannot get you to the goal guaranteed. It will get you some couple of steps closer maybe, and then you will have to do a bit more planning that shows, is shown in black. So you, you do planning uh, and execution, uh, but when you do planning, it, it does delay execution. And when you do execution, you don't do planning. The next model is, is something that we actually uh, have, have implemented, and it's not that hard to do with, with uh, LAO star. It's an interesting idea. Your planning is running uninterrupted continuously and does not stop until it finds the optimal solution. Meanwhile, slightly uh, a, a, a small amount of time after the initial planning process starts, you start executing plans. And there are a couple of things you can do. One, you could say this whole plan is just some advice. So you look up, remember, when LAO star works, there's these data structures. You're in state S7, you, you, you go up to the planner and you say, What's, what is the planner telling me to do in state S7? There are lots of possibilities. One, S7 is already labeled as a solved state. We, we can label these things. You know, basically the optimal action for that is available. That's great, execute that action. Another option is that state seven is not yet in the plan. So you can decide then to wait for it or execute a default action. But basically there is a complex relationship, a non-trivial relationship between the execution process and the planning. I remember some old paper that promoted the idea that planning just provide advice to execution. We never execute these plans, literally. And there is a whole layer of, of execution control that, that, that needs to be. So, so it, it, it is only high level abstract advice. And if it's available, that's great. So the nice thing about the, the version of LA Star, LA Star that we implemented is that, well, if you run your algorithm uninterrupted and you already executed a few steps, you made commitments that in state S0, you're going to go right. You just went right. You don't want the planner to A, reconsider that, right? 
So what we uh, did, we created a mechanism to go into the plan and to say for this state, you freeze the action. However, if you get to S0 again later on, and remember when you plan under uncertainty, you may get to that state again, and you figured out there's a better action, you may want to execute the better action. So we create a new S0. And, and, and from, uh, for that one, you are allowed to modify. It turns out that it's very easy to do that. The algorithm doesn't need to know. The successor function is the same function. All the data structures are the same. It just goes uh, unnoticed that, that, that you, you kind of interfere with what it does a little bit. And in th that way, you can run the planner uninterrupted and, and the execution, well, in, in, in some ways, you, you don't want to delay the first action you take. And in many cases, if this robot needs to get to another building, the first couple of steps are pretty obvious and can be calculated. And actually, they may be even optimal to get to the elevator and so on. So you don't need to, a complete plan. And by the time you get to the elevator, you may have a complete optimal plan. So this allows you to have these kind of relationships. Now, in the case of this reduced models, it has a very uh, specific role. Particularly if you think about um, this the idea of uh, computing, ignoring outcomes, but only allowing one exception. So you're now planning, and every time you take a step, if it happens that you moved sideways, you actually factor that, but only once in the plan. So once it happens, you want to very quickly generate a new plan that will have one exception from there and on. And that's exactly what, what you can do. You, you can very quickly, and if you can do that during the execution of one action, every time an exception happens, by the time you finish the next action, you have one action already in the plan ready for the exception. But by the end of that, you want to, build, to have a new plan from then on. So we, we created an algorithm that can do that, and it doesn't have to be one exception, it can be a couple of k exceptions and so on. So I, I'm going to, okay, so these are the results, and um, what you see here for the racetrack domain, for example, um, you can see the uh, CPU time and, and the total cost that factors quality of the plan. So you can see that the term determinization compared to value iteration and LNR is, is LAO star with uh, a version of LAO star. You can see that, that, that value iteration of an LAO star takes a substantial amount of time, but this is, this is finding optimal plans with the way the heuristic LAO star could, could do better. But still, determinization, one, one thousandth of the, of the time, instantly, practically. But what you see is that determinization in some cases, um, it, it's, well, the, uh, let's see, the total cost that you see here in the, ta the, the table includes the cost of planning. So it, that's why it's confusing. Of course, the total cost of the plan with value iteration is that it's, it's an optimal plan. But once you add the cost of planning and then executing the plan, you see that determinization is actually beneficial, but then if you look at some other reduced models, and the one that wins in this case is what we call M11. It's a model that uses one outcome per action and one exception taken into account in planning. So it's called MLK reduction. The L is for how many outcomes you allow. It could be one at the minimum, um, and, 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 and it could be more. And the second question is how many exceptions so M01, M, determinization is M01, no exceptions and one outcome. M02 apparently performs better. It's still uh, determinization with, um, to a, um, sorry. Yeah, that, I'm sorry, no exceptions with two outcomes per actions. And then the M11 performs better, it's one outcome and one uh, and, and what you can see is that there's a whole space. In more recent work, we've looked at something uh, else, which is uh, the idea that is, I think, also very uh, beneficial to not use a uniform reduced model where maybe you use determinization everywhere or you use M11 reduction everywhere. Uh, it's not surprising that 
when a robot moves through a narrow corridor, you want the full model. And when it navigates through uh, a wider space, you can use less, more crude model. So are you, we're using now this idea of using a portfolio of models and a mechanism to choose where it's more, be more beneficial to use perhaps the full model, but very sparingly. And again, we get substantial savings that way. Okay, I want to move to POMDPs at this point. How much time do I have left? Not much. Yeah. So let's uh, watch some movies. <laughs> so, uh, well, as you know, MDPs are, uh, POMDPs are MDPs where after each action you don't see the underlying states, but instead you get some observations. It can be arbitrary. And you can form a belief state. A belief state is simply a distribution of possible world states. I wanted to just show you first an example of how a, 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 a robot control works with, this robot navigates, you see the goal nodes. In this initial case, it, knows the, it knew the initial state and it's moving through the environment. The only feedback it gets is when it touches things. As you can see, there's a touch sensor and then it knows that it reached that particular. What you see in the blue is the most, the, the bluish state is the most likely state and based on the probabilities, you see the other two, three, four most, uh, most likely belief states. It's where the robot thinks it is in, in the world. And, and um, it's, it's updating these beliefs. It chooses action based on these beliefs uh, until it reaches the goal and confirming that it's the goal. Did you see it moved once and twice and then it knew it's. In this case, it starts with a belief state that's not a single state. Uh, but it's kind of more diffuse. So you can see that after the first action, the belief is almost everywhere. It knows the map, and based on belief update that we'll talk about in a minute, you can see that after some navigation, it's kind of get a better and better sense of where it may be. And um, as it gets really closer to the goal, it kind of knows where it is. And there was some confusion there, but again, it's eliminated. And so you can see the, how the belief states uh, change as it moves through the environment. So, so belief state planning, there's a lot of work here by Leslie Kabling, has been a big uh, player in early work on POMDPs, as, as you probably know, and, and, uh, and this is one of the early problems they have used with Michael Littman's work. The, the famous hallway problem. Essentially, a situation where a robot may be in a certain world and all it sees is its immediate environment. Maybe just whether there is a wall or an obstacle or an open space in, in those four directions. These are the observations. They can be perfect or imperfect. And then when it moves, it's uh, not necessarily perfectly uh, uh, successful in moving to the next ne next uh, state, so it, it needs to take that, that uh, into account. In this case, it wants to get to the starred location, and um, th that was an, an early problem. I think that Leslie's group introduced the tiger problem, um, and that uh, was a, a, an early challenging benchmark in POMDP research when people could barely find the optimal plan for these kind of problems. It is a hard problem. Um, uh, but now the, there's been really lots of progress in this area. In this case, you have an agent that can listen. There is a tiger behind one door and a treasure behind another. And if you open the right door, uh, you get the treasure or the, there is damage to the agent, let's say. Um, and, uh, but when you listen, listening is not perfect with 85%. When you think you heard it on the right, it's 85% reliable, but it could be actually from the left. So the optimal uh, plan would be to listen multiple times and try to update your uh, probability using Bayesian updating and so on. So um, I'm going to go quickly now through a couple of slides. This one shows how the belief update is done. Uh, it's a, uh, once you get an observation and you know the action taken, you just use Bayes rule essentially to find the new belief state and the probability distribution of beliefs. And um, essentially you can build a new MDP, a POMDP is really an MDP in belief space, which is continuous. Uh, 
where your states are belief states, distributions over uh, world states. You can compute the reward function for a belief state, which is pretty trivial. If, you're in a, if you have a, a belief that you're 50% in this state and 50% in this state, obviously the reward for getting into that state is 50% is half the reward for one and, and so on. It's the expected reward. And essentially you can construct all the ingredients of an MDP from a, for a POMDP, except you're dealing with belief states. The actions are the same. And the transition model is the transition model that I just showed in belief space. So what do you do with that? If an, a POMDP is an MDP in belief space, we solved it, except it's a continuous space and you need to deal with that. And if you're dealing with a finite horizon, you can actually solve it using even decision trees, if you want. You basically look at how the decision unfolds. There is an, a value iteration version of a value iteration that has been uh, for finite horizon, again, and, and some improvements of this basic idea that, again, was introduced by Michael Littman and Leslie, uh, early algorithms for solving POMDPs. The key idea is that you can represent the value function as a collection of linear vectors that represents the top value, you, you can think about it, uh, a belief, if you just have a binary state, you can either be in, in here or here, it can be thought of as, 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 as a number between zero and one, your belief state, the probability that you're in state one. And uh, each action would have a certain value if you're in state zero or in state one. And the value moves linearly between the two as the belief changes, obviously. So the value of an action in a belief state is some kind of a vector. And different actions or different policies, if you're already doing horizon three, would be represented by different vectors. And you will have a lot of vectors. The, vec the number of vectors grows exponentially, but you don't need to keep all of them because some of them are dominated by others. And there is a very efficient process of pruning, meaning for a particular vector, there could be other actions that dominate it. Not, it's not necessarily that one action dominates it, but these three actions together dominate in different belief regions. So overall, it's useless. So you don't need to keep all the vectors, and that was the essential idea. You can represent the value function that is over a continuous space uh, using a, co a collection of a finite number of vectors. Each time you update this, you do, you're doing a backup, the number of vector grows by a certain factor, but thanks to pruning, you can maintain a smaller number. This algor algorithm was the first algorithm to solve POMDPs, and it is, 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 is not surprising, it wasn't very efficient. There's been tremendous progress. I want to mention, um, um, let's see, 10 minutes um, or, or, or less. So. I wanted to say a few words about uh, extending these things to multiple agents. So I'm going to skip most of the technical parts on POMDP algorithms. And I want to talk a little bit about, so what happens when we are planning under uncertainty and we have two agents? If we don't have uncertainty, things are pretty, and, and I'm talking about collaborative setting initially. You have two robots, you want them to work together on something. And, and um, it's not actually a different problem. It's the same problem, except that at a any step, you need to decide what robot A will do and what robot B will do, and they will just execute it. All, pol all uh, actions are not contingent action uh, plans, are just sequences of, 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 of uh, actions, and you can find the right pairs of actions for the robots to execute. The problem is a little bit more compli complicated, but for two robots, it's not really much more complicated than for one. Things are dramatically different with uncertainty, particularly if we assume that the robots don't have perfect observations and they cannot share their private observations all the time. And that leads to a model that uh, we call the centralized POMDPs. So essentially we have two agents interacting with an environment, performing actions, each one gets their own streams of observations and forms their own beliefs, but we don't no longer talk just about beliefs about the world. We need to have beliefs about the other agents and maybe beliefs about their beliefs and their knowledge and so on, and that can get quite complicated, but that can be avoided 
uh, depending on, on, on how you uh, represent things. So in this particular line of work, and I'm not going to be able to talk a lot about it, we try to, I to identify what, what parts of the large work and knowledge and algorithms on single agent MDPs and POMDPs uh, you can transfer to this setting and what breaks apart. And at the time we started, it was just when there was a flurry of action on POMDPs and some of the early efficient algorithms like HSVI and so on. So there was a sense that POMDPs, there's some hope because before then people said, okay, it's a nice model, it's a rich model, it can, the world is like that, but we can't solve these problems. But then there was a sense that thanks to sampling and various approximation techniques and improvements in computing, you could really solve uh, some interesting problems as POMDPs. But so, so the first instinct was to say two agent decentralized problem. Why don't we form, formulate that as some, something like a, a POMDP, some form of a POMDP with a different action and state space. But it was hard to do that. And we, we realized that th these are kind of distinct problems that are not as, they are not part of the POMDP even, even uh, and, and uh, they are much more like partially observable stochastic games where you have two agents with arbitrary objectives. And um, one of the early pieces of work looked at the complexity of these problems. I want to show you this work that shows how, actually it's self-explanatory, just read the, by Christopher Amato, who is now a faculty member at Northwestern. So the large box needs to be pushed by two of these robots, the small one can be pushed by a single, and they need to cooperate, and they don't know exactly where boxes are located. And initially there is no communication at all, but they can observe things, but we'll see later on when you can add some signaling. The music is courtesy of Communication is just another action here. You can turn on a signal. That's basically what it is. That is observed by others. Global signaling means that there is some shared bit that can be observed by anyone everywhere at any time. So that, that light that just turned red. So the point that I wanted to make is that you can actually formulate problems that involve distinct decision makers. This is like a um, tracking of weather phenomena by multiple radar. And if one is tracking a tornado, you, it's not enough. You need both of them to be directed in order to get a meaningful reading. So we have a, a, a system that's doing that uh, uh, by, uh, built by an uh, engineering center at UMass. And some questions were involved, how do these coordinate in real time? Um, just based on what they see, basically. Or some limited signaling that you can introduce as communication, but it's just part of the actions they plan. 
And interestingly enough, when you solve these, plan these problems from a decision theoretic perspective and you find the plan, you don't need to decide ahead of time what the signal will mean. You can say there is a signal, there is an action to turn it on and off. What's the optimal plan? Part of the plan is to assign a meaning to that signal. And the meaning, for better or for worse, uh, today we're kind of more concerned with explainable AI. Uh, that's, that's a challenge, but you can get the optimal, the provably optimal plan, and, and the plan may turn it on at one point, and another robot will react to it. And the meaning of the signal is embedded in the plan. You need to analyze the plan to understand what the signal is used for. And it's, in a finite horizon case, it may be that the signal will be used in the first five steps for one purpose, and later on for another purpose, and it's all part of the planning process. There is some really interesting work right now on, on what's called decentralized palm DPs that is trying to ask these questions. They are very complex. How do we make them more simple by introducing things like a language with a fixed semantics. Or one of the biggest questions for PomDPs and certainly for decentralized PomDPs is how to use limited memory. What should be memorized? And one of the possibilities is to say, well, let's, let's uh, decide on that separately. Instead of part of the optimizing of the plan is to decide what to memorize, let's hypothesize that these particular important factors if that, that there is a, a red signal here is an important thing, or that I saw a red signal is an important thing to memorize. We know that. And we will just build that as an assumption and then just find the optimal plan based on that language that has fixed meaning. It makes more sense. Similarly, you know that in many situations that involve multiple agents, you can simplify the problem by introducing conventions and social norms and rules so that the space of actions that you need to consider in any situation is reduced. So we're looking at how to uh, simplify uh, some of these coordination problems by introducing a communication language that has fixed meaning, obviously, and perhaps some other norms and rules. There's all the questions about role assignments. Uh, if you have uh, 20 agents, maybe you want to build some organization from them. And the organizational structure, do you want that to emerge from the planning process? Or maybe you want to decide on it up front, or maybe put some constraint on it and say that these agents will be connected only to these agents and there will be some structure of uh, hierarchy of reporting and so on. So it's not realistic to expect planning to just take this kind of uh, completely, uh, 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 j just the description of the environment and the available actions and signaling and find the optimal plan. It's very complicated, it's sometimes useful to introduce these, these kind of structures that we have already introduced in, in the real world to enable coordination between people. Okay, thank you. Why don't we take a few questions and then break? And then lots of you will come up and ask more questions. Yes. So uh, some of the work we, we've done uh, in, allows for multiple objectives. We haven't worked a lot on that in my group. So yeah, it's mostly for collaborative settings and the DECPOM DP assumes one uh, shared objective function. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't get to this slide or two, but they are available, right? Yep. Uh, where I gave pointers to the repository of algorithms that exist for both uh, PomDPs and DEC PomDPs. So it's in the slides at the very end. Other questions? Yeah. Which one? I didn't hear. Right. There's been a lot of nice work on uh, using what's called factored representation and structured representation. There's really nice, sometimes it's called symbolic uh, representations of value functions. Um, for example, you can represent the entire policy, state, space, and value using uh, 
BDDs and ADDs decision trees essentially that tells you if the state is, is this feature and that feature, the value is seven, you don't need to look at the other. So it's a more compact representation. A version of value iteration for that representation has been developed and there's a lot of work on uh, representing a more uh, structured kind of state spaces that are very large without uh, uh, representing the state space. So one way to go is the LIO star that uses reachability, but the nice thing, that adds another level of compactness. Even in the reachable states, you can exploit structure and the fact that states with similar features have the same value. Um, there's actually a lot of interesting work along these lines. I didn't get too much into reinforcement learning that is very closely related, but algorithms like real-time dynamic programming can be viewed, which is trial-based updates of values, can be viewed as the online versions of LAO star. You can make that kind of connection very nicely. And um, there, there has been a lot of interesting work. If you are looking at algorithms like that that update value based on trajectories and real experience, how to update exploit structure so that you don't update one state or just the states you visited. You can update similar states as well and you can accelerate learning significantly. A robot doesn't need to learn how to do something, how to get out of a room for each room if the room has the same structure and similar, right? So you can actually do these kind of things and, and uh, you can define similarity in lots of different ways and each one of them accelerates learning significantly. Um, okay, good. Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you. And we'll see you back at 10.30 for the talk on risk battle motion planning by Ashley. Yes, thank you. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. אני נוסע מחר לקליפורניה, לא, לקליפורניה לשבוע, ואחרי זה אני באמרס כל אוגוסט, ספטמבר. אתה כן באמרס? כן. אה, אז 